And so we go, well, Pastor Mike, I've seen that letter that you sent out. This message was done before that letter was done. They'll steal the tithe. Why? Two very important things of the church. Two very important things of the temple. They want to take territories that are not theirs. They steal our minds. They steal our money. They steal our morals. And they do it by trying to do three things. Watch this. Watch the three things that they try to influence. They want to influence what we put into our minds. Why is that important? Lust of the eyes. Does that sound familiar? What we put in our bodies. What we're doing to our bodies. Lust of the flesh. All right, we can get BJ up here and have a talk about that. He's seen it. He's seen it all. The things that we do in our bodies and the things that we do to our bodies. What we give or we don't give to the Lord. Now, somebody said, well, why would you put that in there? Because pride of life. We think we can do life without God and without God's principles in our life. We think we can do it out there. And I got a hard word that I wanted to share with you, but I'm going to say it like this, man. If we think for a moment that we can do the life without God and get away with it, man, that's pride. That's pride, man. I mean, we've got to understand. This isn't like a step on your toe type method. There is good news on this. But here's the thing, man. That's how the devil deceives. And it's the same thing that he did to Adam and Eve. And it's the same thing that Jesus conquered in the wilderness, man, when he came back. Right? Think about it. When Jesus came out of the wilderness, what is the very first thing that Satan tempted him with? What was affecting his life? The flesh. Right? Isn't that what the Bible says? Isn't that what it says? It says that he, uh, he, he tempts him with the loaf of bread. Isn't that what he did, right? He, if you be the son of God. He didn't come out and give him a loaf of bread. He said, hey, man, are you hungry? No, he tempted. He tried to tempt Jesus where it, was, where, it, where it was needed. But Jesus dealt with it the right way, right? So can we just take, make an agreement here before we go on to our second, second step? This, can we just agree something? Since they take ownership of things that don't belong to them, in our modern culture, what would we call that? Call that a squatter? Can we just call that squat? Can we just call demonic spirits squatters? They take possession of things that don't belong to them. All right. Can we also make an agreement, man, that we're kicking the squatters out and we're taking possession of the land again? Can we just do that? Some of y'all will get that on the way home and you'll shout, maybe, hopefully. All right. Can we just get that and say, you know what? No longer are we going to have squatter. I'm not going to allow a squatter in my marriage anymore. I'm not going to allow a squatter at my job or my business anymore. No more squatters. We're going to kick them out. We're going to take back the authority that belongs. To, to my family and to us, all right? To my family and to us, all right? Number two, man, in this, this is really important. We look at, we look at sometimes things and we think, oh, you know what? Here, I'll go there in a minute. Uh, number two, demons are vicious. All right, I know there's a lot of, you know, I was actually going to put like a cartoon character, man, of the little demons, what we think a little demon looks like, you know, a little pitch tail and, you know, little horns, a little red guy, you know, got the little pitchfork, little horny t- uh, tail there and, and we, that's how kind of we think of demonic spirits. We think of a demon kind of that way, man. That's absolutely false. We have to understand, man, that they're very vicious, man. They're out to get you, all right? I don't want you to go home and have nightmares because we got the authority of Jesus in us, right? Amen? All right, so they can't, they can't defeat us if we let them, if we don't let them, praise God. But look here, man. Satan has never had a merciful moment. He never looks at, he doesn't look at, you know, poor Christian Heidi, oh man, look at Heidi, she just had such a rough week today, had to chase after that little boy, man, and just, uh, you know, he, she just had, you know what, hey guys, hey, hey, y'all come in, y'all, all right, all right, team meeting demons, all right, listen, Heidi Thedford's off limits for a week, okay, let's just give her a break, let's just, whew, she's really, she's really having a rough one, okay, I'll tell you something, man, that ain't how the enemy works, he's vicious, and he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And we've got to recognize that. And what, Habakkuk chapter 1, 7 through 9. Watch this, man. This is a great description, right? They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity proceed, proceed from themselves. In other words, they are so bad, their reputation of them goes before them. Their horses also are swifter than leopards. I don't know any horse on earth that is swifter than a leopard. More fierce than evening wolves. Evening wolves. You need to underline that. We're going to come back to it. Evening wolves. Their charges charge ahead. Their cavalry comes from afar. Watch this. They fly as the eagle that hastens to eat. They're looking for food. They're looking for a place. They're looking for a home. All right? They all come for violence. Underline that. Their faces are set like the east wind. They gather captives like sand. And I don't have time to go into, man, just all of this stuff, man. Of, of, of the rule, kind of how these 
demons, man, that, that rule. And we, we just look at it like, man, it's, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. There are scriptures after scripture that refer to demon as wolves. And it's interesting. That's why I want you to underline that, that e they gather as evening wolves. Here's what I want you to understand something before we go into some of these, these deals. When you think of a demon, I want you to really think of wolves for a moment. And the reason I want you to think of wolves is because we look at any National Geographic fans. I mean, y'all watch that. I, I love watching that show, you know. And you, and you sit back there and you, you watch the guy with the camera, right? And he's talking really soft and, and he's talking about the wolf. And it probably has an Australian accent. I can't do that because I'll look like an idiot up here, right? Uh, I barely can talk in English, so I'm not even going to try to, uh, uh, that, that accent, right? But they sit there and they're looking at these, deem or these uh, demons, these wolves. <laughs> And they're like, man, they're so beautiful. They're so precious. Oh, let's save the wolf, right? And this wolf is sitting at them, and they're just looking at them, kind of eye tilted, right? And they're all by themselves. It's just one lone wolf. And, and, and the, the announcer will say something really rid ridiculous and retarded, like, he's checking us out. He's curious of us. And, and he, uh, he, he, you know, maybe, maybe we can approach him. And, 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 you know, if we just stay here long enough and become his friend, you know, we're going to. No, he is not. He is a predator. Brother and sister, let me tell you, that wolf is looking for lunch. And he's going, man, I'm waiting for a weakness. Where's the weakness at in that dude? And here's the thing about wolves. They never attack by themselves. They've never attacked by themselves. They always attack by packs. And so if you come across a wolf, I just don't know where y'all hanging out, man, but maybe you do. You hang out with wolves. And, uh, and, and you see a wolf, there's probably some others running around. I remember a man hearing the story. It's really good. I used, Robin and I used to live in Greenville, and we used to go to eat at a place called Chorus Cafe. It was a really nice place to eat off of uh, 34, right down the road from us. And inside there, man, there was a wolf that was about like this tall, the blonde wolf, beautiful. You know, of course, they made the vicious, you know, mouth open type deal, right? And uh, the story goes, uh, the owner, that actually the house that we lived in, he had uh, moved and um, uh, lived on the other side of Cattle Mills. And I think now he does like uh, uh, taxidermy type stuff. And he came out of his backyard, or back of house one morning, and he looked down by a deer feeder he had way down there, just enough to shoot with a rifle, uh, and he could see a dog crossing over by the deer feeder. And he's looking down there going, man, that's, that's pretty interesting stuff. And so, but he kept looking at this dog, going, that's a weird looking dog. And so at first, he thinks this is a coyote. So he pulls out his 443 or 440, whatever, the, the big long rifle, hunting rifle. He, 243, thank you, brother. He got a hunter right here. All right, so he pulls out 243, and he takes Amy shoots. And he, he hits it, and the, the, the dog lays down. So he goes over there to this dog, and the closer he gets, the more stranger this dog looks. He's like, man, that cannot be a coyote, man. So he gets over to this thing, this massive dog, and uh, he still doesn't understand what it is. So he calls the game warden up. The game warden comes out to his place and looks at it. And what it was, it was a tag, watch this, a tag uh, wolf that was let loose in the northernest part of Oklahoma. And it was out here in Cattle Mills. Let me tell you something. Them boys know how to travel. That's a big old distance, man. That's some traveling, right? But it was a full-grown wolf. And it's still, I don't know where, what they did with it now because Chorus is closed down. Uh, but it used to be sitting up there in Chorus Cafe. What an amazing story. Wolves are vicious. And they'll get wherever they need to get and go wherever they need to go to suit for themselves, especially when it comes to survival. Look here, Ezekiel twenty two twenty seven. Look at here. Her princes in her mind are like wolves tearing the prey to shed blood to destroy people and to get dishonest gain. More activity of the demonic there. See again that this re re refers not only to wolves, but also lust of the flesh, pride of life, and lust of the eyes. Zephaniah 3, 3. Watch this. Her princes in her hands are roaring lions. Her judges, again, there's that word again, evening wolves that leave not a bone until morning. Man, this is really interesting. What does it mean? I love this term. We've seen this term now twice, evening wolves. Why is that important? I'm going to set somebody free this morning if you'll receive this, man. Many of you, man, have the worst time sleeping at night, and it's when at night when you lay your head down, isn't it? When your mind begins to wander, your mind begins to travel, all the worries that you can think about. Why is it important? Because demons attack at night, just like wolves do. Wolves attack at night. I can't tell you how many times they're having a great day, man. Everything's peaceful. And then all of a sudden, man, you lay your head down and everything becomes still. And now you're worried about the kids. You're worried about whether or not you're going to make it financially. You're worried about this. You're worried about that. you got a job. you got all this stuff going on that's worrying in you. Why is that important? You know the greatest remedy that you can do to, to cure that? Not only prayer, but get up and start reading your word. 
Get up and start reading your word. Don't let them, don't let them, don't let that be a deal. And a lot of people struggle with that in their minds at night. Reading the word at night, I cannot tell you what that will do for you. It will absolutely change your life. In both of these past passages, they're referring to the leaders of Israel who are under the influence of demonic spirits. And what most tell you in these descriptions is the degree of savagery associated with these princesses. See, princesses rule, demonic princesses rule in regions. It's just like the military, okay? They have regions that they're over. So if you would go to Las Vegas, for instance, there is a de demonic region or demonic spirit that kind of oversees that region, all right? And it wouldn't take a rocket scientist or anybody with any Christian sense to go, I kind of have an idea of what, what spirit would be over Los Angeles, or not Los Angeles, I'm sorry, uh, Las Vegas or that area, right? Because we got gambling, we got sex, we got a lot of other stuff going on there, right? So it doesn't take a rocket science to figure that out, right? How many times have we walked into a place, and as soon as we walk into different areas, man, we feel these different things, things something's not right, right? Something's not right spiritually, right? All right. Now, we need to understand the power of this, and the reason why I want to talk about this is because, and I know there's a lot, we're getting ready to celebrate Halloween, all right? And if you celebrate Halloween, I'm going to tell you, just as epic life, we don't necessarily promote Halloween, okay? But if you do celebrate Halloween, can I ask you a favor, man? Let's not celebrate demons. Let's not celebrate witchcraft, all right? So get some goofy little costume and put them in a goofy costume, Spider-Man, whatever, but don't dress them up as demons. Let's not glorify the demonic. And sometimes we do that in the church, okay? Even as Christians, we've done that before. Let's not glorify the, the demonic. We got number one, the number one movie right now, billions of dollars, is a movie called It. Gore and horror and all of this stuff, and we celebrate it. I walked in last night into our home. Robin goes, isn't that what you're preaching on tomorrow? I said, I just want to see this because this is my point. It's the number one or top ten um, uh, uh, series, I guess is what you would call it, television series that's on cable or, or direct TV or whatever. Anybody want to know what it is? No, it's ASL, what's called American Horror, or AHL, American Horror Story. The Cult. This is graphic stuff, man. I was like, oh my gosh. And we glorify these things. Now, I'm not going to get up here and tell you what you can or cannot do in your home. What I am going to tell you, man, is that we have problems within the body of Christ as believers because we have opened up doors in our life and can't understand why, uh, you know, my marriage isn't working out, why I'm always having bad dreams and I'm always having migraine headaches and I'm having all this garbage that's going on in my life. Why is this happening? And we've opened the doorway, man, to stuff that we're trying to, that Hollywood tries to glorify. Look at what our, country, our community, our, our culture is turning to. They turn to the occult. They turn to this weird stuff. Now, I, I got to tell you guys, so just in a, can I openly confess here this morning, okay? Uh, Pastor Mike was a horror movie lover, man. The Shining, one of my first ones, loved it. Loved that movie. But, man, God kind of got a hold of my heart and said, man, that's not glorifying me, man. It glorifies murder. I mean, red rum, red rum, right? I mean, so I had to really have a, a change of things in my life and go, man, this is, this is not glorifying God. Acts 20, 29. Paul warns the church that when he leaves to be mindful of de or demons, but wolves that come in. He says, for I know this, that after my departure, watch, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. We glorify some of this stuff, man, but it's to destroy the church. It's to destroy you. Satan, Jesus said this. He said, woe unto you, earth, for the devil has been cast down amongst you. And he knows his time is short. See, we can't glorify something that's wrong. And I know we don't talk a lot about this in church anymore. We go, you know, man, that's kind of, we, we, we kind of throw the bath out with the baby out with the bath water. It's kind of weird, so we don't want to talk about it. But we need to. We need to call it what it is, man, that Satan is on the move, man, and he wants to destroy. See, Paul warned in the church, the book of Acts, that, they're gonna, that wolves would come. Matter of fact, there's another passage that says, man, be mindful of sheep or wolves in sheep's clothing. So that sheep can come into the church and devour the church because they're wolves. And he wasn't talking about a person. He was talking about the spirit that was controlling that person. Because a sheep is someone that's controlled by who? Jesus, right? And it says, my, my sheep hear my voice, and a stranger's voice they'll not shout. See, and that's why it's so vital, man, when we understand that the idea to get, as a Christian, to get on the outer skirts of the flock is dangerous. 
It's, that's, where the, that's where wolves attack. See, you never see a wolf coming into the middle of the pack. Why? Who stands there? The shepherd does. See, we get fearful of the shepherd, man, because the shepherd carries a staff. But the staff isn't for the sheep. The staff is for the wolves. And so the wolves sit back. Watch, watch the channel. It's so cool, man. Watch this. That the, the, the wolves sit in the outer dark, the darkened areas, man, in the tree line, right? And they're watching this flock. And what are they looking for? The healthy? The strong? Those that are connected to the shepherd? Absolutely not. They're looking for the lame. The broken. The old. Sorry, some of you guys. Praise God. <laughs> right? They stand on the fringes and they watch for those lambs and those sheep to get on the outskirts of the fringes. And those are the ones that get attacked. That's why it's important, man. If it's me, man, I'm like, excuse me, pardon me, excuse me, pardon me. Get out of the way. I'm getting up. Hey, hey, shepherd, how you doing, man? <laughs> I'm getting up there, man. Back in the day, man, I watched this just two days ago, man. It's really interesting. Uh, I'm watching, uh, the, they were doing some type of documentary in Israel about shepherds. And uh, behind this guy that he's talking was this, this, this enormous cave. It was really cool. It looked like a, just a big old boulder standing over this thing. And in front of the cave, you can see what used to be about a half wall. It was really, really cool, right? And, he's, and then beside the wall, the wall came only pouring. And there's probably like a little four-foot four doorway or where a gate would be, right? And so the guy's talking, he said, back in, back in that day, he said what they would do is they, uh, when it was going to be stormy out or it was going to be uh, late at night, uh, the shepherd would herd all the sheep into this cave and push them all in into that little doorway. And then back then, they didn't have, like, gates, you know, and keys and locks and all that stuff. So what the shepherd would do is the shepherd would take his staff and he would lay down in front of that door to not only protect the sheep from getting out, but what? Predators getting in and jesus makes a point about this when he says that i am the gate that no one can come to the father except by me right but he says that there are will be, be be weary of false shepherds or false gates that they try to get in a different way see jesus comes in through what the heart right but a demonic spirit will try to come in a different route and we have to be mindful of this stuff guys really crazy i know what time we got all right we're almost done the final one, number three, we've got to understand that demons are cunning. They're very cunning. Uh, Daniel 2 and 2 says, Then the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans. Look at where the Chaldeans are listed among. All right? Sorcerers, astrologers, magicians. What do magicians do? Huh? They distract so they can deceive. Oh, my goodness. All right? Astrologers try to predict the future. Right? Sorcerers are in contact with the supernatural. Chaldeans were trying to distract, deceive, and determine the future. Some of you guys, man, have opened doorways by this kind of stuff, man. And look, there ain't no, look, no stone, okay? Listen to me. Horoscopes. Tarot cards. We open the doorways, man, into areas, man, that we don't understand why our lives are, why we're struggling in our lives, but yet we've opened the doorway to some of these things. That's what the Chaldeans did. They were astrologers and sorcerers and magicians. Matter of fact, King Saul, man, was a great king until he decided to go to a sorcerer to try to get the future determined instead of going to his father or to God. Habakkuk 1.15. They take up all of them with a hook. They catch them in their net and gather them in their dragnet. Therefore, they rejoice and are glad. Satan is doing the same thing as the Chaldeans were back in that day, right? He tries to distract us from what's important in life, and he deceives us because he's a liar. And he tries to determine our future by pointing us down a path of destruction. We need to stop listening to him. We get deceived by that, right? And so listen, if, if, if you knew what he does, he disguises it, man. It, and you look into our world, look in your life right now. And there's things that you've allowed in your life that you thought, man, was innocent, man. If you knew it was a hook, if you knew it was a trap, you would have never fell for it. But we do it because we don't know, right? And that's why the Bible says, man, don't be ignorant of his devices. Satan will never show you the barbed hook. He disguises it so that we'll take the bait. It's going to look like success. It's going to look like happiness. It's going to look like maybe the camouflage Christianity. It's, he's not going to show you what the hook looks like, guys. You wouldn't fall for it if you knew it was going to trap you. Satan did the same thing to Jesus. We talked about this already. Matthew 4, 3 is the scripture. Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Right? 
Satan knew what Jesus was going through. I, he had just came out of a fast for 40 days and 40 nights. He knew what he needed to do to try to tempt him. But Satan departed, and when he departed, he said something that was very, very important, wasn't it? He said he waited for an opportune time. An opportune time for what? When Jesus would be weak. He doesn't attack you when you're strong. He doesn't attack you when you're, when you're with the herd. He doesn't attack you when you're close to the shepherd. He, get, he attacks you as you get further away from him. In the book that we're reading that we're going to use in our freedom ministry, man, it's got a really powerful statement. It says the closer to God that you grow, the weaker the addiction or the whatever it is that you need freedom from gets. The further away you grow from that, the more weaker or the more weaker your faith becomes and the more stronger that addiction or that anxiety or that fear or whatever it is becomes. And there's a whole reason behind that. Whole reason behind that, right? Think about this. Another example, and we're not going to read it. 2 Samuel 11, 2 through 5. Read this on your own. But who else could have masterminded that Bathsheba would be out there at the exact moment that King David walked out onto his balcony? The Bible says that he had done it before. Matter of fact, it said many days he had walked out. He had, he had, he had been sleeping till noon and been getting up and walking out onto his balcony. Now, surveying the thing. Now, yes, David messed up because David's butt was supposed to be in the battle. He's supposed to be fighting, right? The guy, King David, but instead he walked into his balcony, and who could have mastermind to have Bathsheba there at the exact moment that the king walked out? During the day. It was during the day. It was a trap. Who else does that? Satan is very cunning, guys. Satan is very cunning. All right. Paul encourages us to put on the whole armor of God in Ephesians 6.11. I'll give you some real good news real quick. I don't want you to forget that, that, that we, we, look at, we look at the devil sometimes and we think, man, that he's stupid or that he's, you know, whatever. But, man, he's smart. He's cunning. He's cunning. He's got a plan just as dad has a plan. And that plan, man, is he's out for destruction. But Paul encourages us to put on the whole armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6, 11 so that we can stand against the wiles of the devil. That word wiles is translated methodia, meaning what? Method. Method. Methodia. Daniel 7.25 says that he shall speak pompous words against the Most High. He shall persecute the saints of the Most High and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints will be given into his hand for a time and a time's half a time. Let me tell you something. He's out for destruction. That's why it's important that we put on the full armor of God. He'll attack you when you're weak and not when you're strong, and he'll look for your weakness. One of the things I've told people before, man, is that the, the enemy's not going to attack me with something that doesn't work. He knows what works on me. Why? Because he studies us. He's cunning. He's crafty. He's vicious. He's a thief. Words of hope. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. That's your memory verse, by the way. It says, be sober. That means to have a sound mind, by the way. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, that's a legal term, okay? Your adversary, matter of fact, I went back there and looked it up, man, and it's actually come from the same word antagonistic. Those two words are connected. They're cousins. So he's an antagonizer. But it's also a legal courtroom term. Adversary, it's one that comes against you, you stand against in a court of law. Shall persecute, let's say, oh, my bad. Uh, devil walks about like a roaring lion. Your adversary, the devil... Walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, standing fast in the faith. Knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brother in the world. We do this by staying close to the shepherd. We do this by staying close to the shepherd. Some of you are on the fringes, man. Can I encourage you today? Can I challenge you today? Get in. Get closer. Maybe you've drifted a little bit. Come back. Get back into the fold. Psalms 23 and 1, a psalm of David. The Lord... What? He's my shepherd. I shall not want, man. God's desire. Jesus is our shepherd. He's there to protect us, to watch over us. He wants to. Uh, somebody said this today uh, to me uh, yesterday. I think it was Brett. The coolest thing, man, is that all we got to do is stand ground, stand fast. Say, man, I want to come in. I want I want to be closer in there. And here's the coolest thing, man. You're not even going to have to fight. It's already done. All you got to do is get out from being in the fringes, man, and get in and kind of wiggle your little self up in there and get close to the Father and let him do the rest. I love that, man. That was a good word. Psalm 23 and 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, 
for you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. If you're feeling oppressed by the evil, by be steadfast. Run back to the shepherd. And I think that's where a lot of us get to, man. You've opened up things in your life, man. It's time to come back. It's time to get, it's time to close that door. 